Good morning. Welcome to Catalyst. My name is Coach Bill. Pastor Bill could not be here again today. He apologizes, but he promises if you use your connection card that he will be there to answer you. Today, my job is to help you review the basics of being a Christian. Like we talked about last week, when you look at professional athletes, they never outgrow the basics. A professional athlete is going to have someone who teaches them about nutrition, who helps them with their strength, who helps them on the individual pieces of a game. Steph Curry's got a shooting coach and a strength coach. And the higher you get, the more specific you need to be. Or another way I could say it is maturity seeks correction. So as we continue our Back to Basics series this morning, let me go ahead and give you the title to today's message is Back to Basics Worship. If you brought your Bibles, you can turn or tap with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 19 through 26. While you're going there, John chapter 4, 19 to 26. While you're going there, let me go ahead and give you the key thought that sort of brings all of these back to basics messages together. Here it is. True success, true success comes from getting better at the basics. True maturity seeks out values and submits to correction along the way. True maturity seeks out values and submits to correction along the way. There is no such thing as a retired Christian. You never outgrow maturity. We never outgrow Jesus. And we definitely never outgrow the Holy Spirit. So, Before I speak about worship, let me just ask you a simple question. Just as much as a basketball player never outgrows the fundamental of dribbling the ball and shooting, a Christian should never outgrow the fundamentals of prayer and of worship. So this is a rhetorical question. I want you to answer in your head only. If you happen to be sitting next to your spouse, you are always free to elbow them. That is all right. If the sole measure of your maturity as a Christian, if the sole measure were measured on the amount of worship that you give to God on a weekly basis, I don't mean just on Sunday mornings from 10 to 12, the sole measure of your maturity was the amount of time you spend worshiping the Lord on the week. How mature are you really? Is Sunday morning the only time that we worship? No. It shouldn't be. Hopefully it's not. Let me just tell you right now. If Sunday morning is the only time that you worship, that's like being a basketball player that the only time they touch a basketball is during a game. I don't know, Jesse, that's probably not a successful strategy for being successful, right? Right. See, I got to check in with my coach because I'm not too good at the sports balls. I'm fairly certain that to be good at something, you have to practice. And you have to practice on your own time and work on your own fundamentals. And then when you come together as a team, all of that individual strength is harnessed together. That's what Sunday morning is. That's what we just did together. Our joint and unified worship of the name of Jesus is what we do on Sundays. But I think, especially here in America, we have a problem understanding what worship even is. So let me, let me give you, here's, here's a statement I want to give you. Worship is the single most defining characteristic in the life of a believer. Worship is the single most defining characteristic. Now it's not going to be here, it's not going to be on the screen, but let me just read you a couple of things here. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Cain and Abel brought their gifts to the Lord, Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Enosh, Adam's grandson, worshiped the Lord by name, Genesis 4, 26. Abraham, I mean, excuse me, Noah took animals on the ark specifically to worship, Genesis chapter 7, verse 2. Abraham made sacrifices to the Lord, Genesis 12, 8, 13, 4, and 21, 33. Abraham's servants worshiped the Lord, Genesis 24, 26. Isaac worshiped the Lord, Genesis 26, 25. Jacob worshiped the Lord, Genesis 28, 25. And Joseph worshiped God for his plans. Genesis 45, verse 8. And that's just the first book of the Bible. Worship is the single most defining characteristic of our lives as Christ followers. Yet in our culture, people struggle to understand 
what is worship? And then if you don't understand what is worship, then how to worship gets a lot more confusing. If you don't first define what is worship, how to worship is almost impossible. It's literally throwing a dart at a dartboard in a dark room where you can't even see the target. So in order to help understand this, I want to go back and take a look at Jesus' own teaching on worship. So let me first give you the setting here. Here's your setting for John chapter 4. We will begin reading in verse 19 in just a moment. But before I read it, I want you to understand the setting that is taking place. Jesus is in Samaria. Now first you have to understand, Samaria is a place that Jews avoid. He is speaking to a woman alone, which Jewish teachers usually avoid. Jesus' most powerful teaching on worship is given in a culturally divided setting. If you remember your first century geography, right? Think about a snowman, right? Down here at the bottom, the bottom of the snowman, that's Judea. The middle of the snowman, that's Samaria. The top of the snowman, that's Galilee. Nazareth is up here in Galilee. Jerusalem is on the bottom part down here in Judea. The Jews disliked the Samaritans so much that they would leave Galilee, cross over the Jordan River into this area over here called Perea, which is largely all Gentile. If you ever heard the word Decapolis, the 10 cities of the Decapolis over here on the other side of the Jordan River. The Jews from Galilee or Nazareth, where Jesus is from, they would cross the river, go all the way down on the Gentile side, and then cross back over the river when they made it to Judea all so that they could avoid Samaritans. It is the most racially charged part of the New Testament that we don't give enough credence to. And if you do not understand the racial frustration and implication of Jesus as a Jewish teacher alone with a woman who's a Samaritan, that's a big deal. It's a big deal. Jews were used to pilgrimaging, pilgrimaging, that's a word, right? We're going to make it a word today, pilgrimaging. They would leave, cross the river just to avoid setting foot on the land that the Samaritans lived on. That is the depth of the cultural hatred between these two groups. It would be like us trying to get to North Carolina, but having such hatred for Virginians that we have to cross all the way over to like Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, go all the way down there, and then cross over to Carolina. Just because we hate Virginians so much that we don't even want to set foot on the land they live in. And it is in this cultural setting that Jesus gives his greatest teaching on worship. Because, and as I hope we're going to see here, Jesus is going to drop an amazing bit of information that if you didn't understand everything I just said, you might have missed. So let's first read the scriptures together. John chapter 4, I'll begin reading in verse 19. This is, we're jumping into the middle of a conversation. Jesus is in Samaria. He He took his disciples and walked straight through Samaria to go home to Galilee. Instead of going over, they are already mad uncomfortable. And then he sends them into town to go get food while Jesus stays here at the well to speak to a lone woman by himself. Verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. And then she asks a question. Verse 20. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Verse 23, a time is coming and now has come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Verse 25, the woman said, I know that the Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, 
He will explain everything to us. And then 26, then Jesus declared, I, the one who am speaking to you, am he. Now, some of you may be familiar with this story. Jesus goes to the well. He asks for a drink of water. The woman gets a little bit of a tood. Give me, the, give me this water so I don't have to come back to the well. Jesus then points out that she's had five husbands. I skipped over that because I want us to only focus on Jesus' words right here about teaching. So if we rewind back to verse 19, I start with 19 because this is the Samaritan woman's recognition of Jesus' prophecy. She says, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. That is in response to Jesus saying, hey, go call your husband. Husband. And Jesus said, you're totally right. You've had five husbands and the man you're living with now is not your husband. Good job. To which she says, oh, you must be a prophet. Jesus opened her life and her closet and laid it bare right there at the well. And she goes, oh, so it's like that. Okay, you must be a prophet. And then she asks a question in verse 20. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that, uh, claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. So here's the backstory that you need to understand. Does anybody remember in the back part of the Old Testament, God's people go into exile, right? So if you remember your Old Testament, God creates stuff, then there's patriarchs, then they finally, they go to Exodus, Moses, they move into Joshua. After Joshua, there's judges, then there's a group of kings. There's three kings over the united monarchy, right? Who was the first king of Israel, anybody? Starts with an S. Saul. Saul's followed by David. David's followed by Solomon. After those three, the nation splits in half. There's the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. That's the divided kingdom period. And then they really, 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 really mess up. And God has to put them in time out. And that's the time of the exile. There's a Assyrian and a Babylonian and then finally a Persian captivity. And then everybody gets to come home. This is what happened during that exile period. God sends his people into time out. The Samaritans stayed in the land. But because at the beginning of the exile, they destroyed the temple at Jerusalem, the Samaritans built a second temple on Mount Gerizim, if my memory serves, and they built their own priesthood. And for the 70 years that Israel's in captivity in Assyria, Babylon, and Persia, the Samaritans have completely rebuilt a replacement temple a replacement priesthood, replacement sacrifices, replacement everything. So when the Jews come home, right? Now you're talking Ezra, Nehemiah, that time period. When they come home and they come home to rebuild Jerusalem, the Samaritans are like, dudes, we already did this, man. Just come up here and worship with us. We're good. We already got sacrifices. We got priests. We've been holding it down now for like 70 something years. We're good. Just come worship with us. But then Ezra opened the law. And he realized, wait a minute, God said we have to worship here in Jerusalem. And because of the way the Samaritans treated the Jews during the exile period, see, the Samaritans hate the Jews just as much as the Jews hate the Samaritans. But it's in that hatred that they created a whole second place of worship to try to replace God's temple in Jerusalem. That's the backstory to this verse 20. See, there's God's temple in Jerusalem, we're super used to seeing that. In the Gospels, Jesus goes there. He kicks over the tables of the money changers. You're super used to the Jerusalem temple. Now I need you to realize there's an entire carbon copy built over in Samaria, and the Samaritans are worshiping God over here. And the Jews are like, but that's not what God said. And the Samaritans are like, yeah, but worship's worship. And so we wanted to worship him closer to home. And the commute all the way down there after they destroyed your city was, was just whack. I'm going to worship him at home. And that's where the problem is. See, the Samaritans in verse 20 recreated the temple on their own mountain and said, nope, we're going to worship. Now, we're going to worship the same God, but we're going to worship him over here. And then when the Jews come home, they're like, um... Anthony, you can't do that, like God's word said so. They're like, yeah, but that was figurative, right? He, was, he didn't really mean exactly Jerusalem. Anywhere that we worship can be our Jerusalem. And you see what happens? That quickly, you abandon the literal interpretation of Scripture to authorize worship the way you want it to happen. 
That's what the Samaritans were doing. That's the backstory to the question here in verse 20. Our ancestors, meaning the Samaritans during the exile period, built an, uh, an inauthentic or a copy temple in Samaria and then taught their children and their children's children to worship the God of the universe over here the way I say to worship. And then when the Jews come home, right, and everybody's got to rebuild the actual temple because God's city is Jerusalem, now we've got a problem. We've got two different groups of people who both say they worship God, who are worshiping God in completely different places and in different ways. And both of them say that they're right and the other is wrong. I can't tell you how much this sounds like the American church from my perspective. You know, how many times, and, and forgive me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just single out the worship team here for a minute. Worship team, how many times have you been pulled into the worship war conversation, right? Style of music, how the lights should be in the sanctuary, um, hymns versus uh, contemporary, piano versus guitar, drums, no drums, choir robes, no choir robes. Do you see that we're still fighting the same battle today? We may not be arguing about location, Jerusalem versus Samaria, but we are still arguing the mechanics of worship in our day and age. Well, I, well, I think worship should be this way. Well, I think worship should be this way. So everybody put your seatbelt on. Here's the first thing Coach Bill needs to tell you. I don't care what you think about worship. Are you the definition of what is worship? Are you the one who is receiving the worship? Are you the one that wrote the book who decides what is true worship? Then just admit you are allowed to have your opinions. But your opinions aren't better than his. Right? So if we could just have a little humility today and realize we are no better than the Jews and the Samaritans in the first century. We are still arguing about what the right way to worship is. We're just now arguing with our modern day tools. We're arguing about screens and instruments instead of about locations and priesthoods. And I, don't even get me started on the argument of whether worship team members are, are ministers and priests or whether they're musicians and singers. What about all the AV guys back there? Do we have to check their theological knowledge before Matt's allowed to change the camera angle? I mean, trust me, there's a lot of war going on in the worship department. Jesus gets the chance to tell us exactly how to deal with it. In verse 20, the Samaritan woman lays up the question really great. And Jesus in 21 goes, okay, woman, here. First thing I need to understand, this word woman here is not disrespectful. Jesus is not disrespecting her. He is using a very common address. Ma'am might be a way I could use it if I were speaking in Southern culture today. Ma'am, here you go. He's not be like, woman. He's, he's not saying it in a sarcastic tone. He is beginning with a respectful address for another woman. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me. Now, he, the woman already thinks that Jesus is a prophet, right? Jesus already opened her life bare. She knows Jesus is about to speak some truth. Verse 21, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Do you notice how Jesus answers her question? The Samaritan woman says, Jesus, I'm confused. Tell me, are we supposed to do this or that? And Jesus says, you're both wrong. Jesus says the question itself is what's wrong. And I think there's a lot that we could learn from that. Lord, should we worship with hymns or with choruses? Should we worship with guitar or with piano? If Jesus were alive today, he'd tell you the same thing. Play guitar. <laughs> Sorry. As a guitar player, I could not miss that moment. No, Jesus would say the same thing. You're asking the wrong question. You're asking the how question when you should be asking the who question. The who is always more important than the how. Watch what he says here in 21. Believe me, a time is coming. What does that mean? A time is coming because something's going to change the landscape of worship. And when that something comes and the landscape changes, the way we worship will change. Now, what is Jesus talking about? Jesus is talking about himself. 
He's talking about the crucifixion, the resurrection, the arrival of the Spirit, the birth of the church. All of that is coming. I mean, Jesus is in his earthly ministry. All of that is coming within two, maybe a little less years from the moment that Jesus is having this conversation. Woman, you don't know it yet, but everything about to change. The whole landscape of worship is about to change. Verse 21, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. If you read that sentence by itself, it sounds a little gruff, right? Jesus is not being insulting. He is bringing it back to truth. He is bringing the focus of worship back to the truth of God's salvific plan. What makes the Jews different from every other nation on the planet? One thing. God chose a singular nation and tasked them with the job of showing himself to the rest of the world. The Jews are a special chosen people, not because every single person who's born a Jew is automatically saved from birth. That's not what the Old Testament says. That's not what any of the Bible says. But the Jews were selected and chosen as a people. When God spoke to Abram, right? I'm going to give you the, the New International Bill version. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my peeps. I'm going to bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. The entire world will be blessed through your descendants. Remember that last line? That's the mission that the Jews were left, that the whole world would be blessed through one of their descendants. Well, who is that descendant? Jesus. So now you have the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecy telling a Samaritan woman, someone who's supposed to be hated by the Jews, You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Jesus is not wrong. Jesus is the promised Jewish Messiah of the Old Testament. Don't take away Jesus' Hebrew-ness, his Jewish-ness, because then you disconnect him from all that was promised about him in the Old Testament. But salvation didn't come through the Samaritans. It came through the Jews. Now verse 23, watch this. He doesn't leave it there. If he had left it there, it might sound like just first century Judaism where we're better than you. But watch this, verse 23, yet. Salvation comes from the Jews, but yet. A time is coming and has now come. Remember that time I told you about where the game's totally going to change? Guess what, lady? It's here. It's right now. A time is coming and and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Here's a second thing you may, may not know that Jesus is making abundantly clear. The Father is seeking those who will worship Him correctly. Don't miss that last part. God is not seeking those who will worship Him the way they want. He is seeking those who will worship Him the way He wants. He is the one who makes the rules because he is the one who made the rules and everything in the cosmos. He is the object of our worship. Therefore, he is the only one who can define what is and is not good worship. Now, you may have a particular style of music that you like versus not like. That's okay. You are permitted that. You are a free will human creature and if if you like piano more than guitar, then I love you. I like guitar just as much as piano. I like orchestras, and I like vocals and choirs. I like all kinds of sounds. But my personal preferences never define what is and is not good worship. And especially for those of us who serve in the worship area, it's a very fine line that you've got to walk where you got to realize that you might like something and it still not be good worship. I'll let you in on a really big secret. I don't like every song we sing. I don't have to. And you would say, well, wait a minute, you're the pastor. Don't you have No, I don't. I don't have to like everything. I don't. You know why? The, if you listen to my worship playlist in my car, it is very different from what we sing on Sundays. It's very different. I've got everything in there from gospel to skillet. Heavy, heavy electric rock. And I love it all. But it's because I love the object of worship. I can put on the Gaithers right next to Van Halen. Music style-wise, it doesn't make a difference. If that is the true object of worship, 
Yes, you are free to worship in a style that you enjoy hearing, but that style that you enjoy hearing doesn't make your worship any better. And that's tough for us as worshipers because I'll be honest, I want our worship to sound good, right? I think, I think Megan and Melanie did an amazing job singing together this morning. I love the way they sound. They sound great. Let me ask you a question. Would the worship, the actual true value of worship, be lower if they were less talented? You're correct. It wouldn't be. You know what the Bible says? And I, t- I tell, tell young worship leaders this all the time. The Bible says make a joyful joy. Yep. You notice God didn't say anything about key signature, melody, harmony, rhythm, time signature, capos. He didn't say any of that. He just said make a joyful noise. You could go to the Psalms and David said, worship the Lord with the clanging of the cymbals. If the object of worship is correct, the style of worship shouldn't matter. And now here, Coach Bill's going to piss you off again. You ready? If you can't worship outside of a musical style that you don't like, you've made the musical style the idol, not the object of worship. You should be able to go into any church on a Sunday morning and sit next to someone who loves Jesus, and I don't care if they're singing hymns to a piano that's out of tune or they've got a full-on U2-level rock band on stage, or let's go worship with um, Quakers. No, No instruments at all, just vocals. They can sing, man. If you can't worship in a musical style that you don't like, you're not actually worshiping God, you're worshiping worship. And that's bad. That's wrong. That's idolatry at its core. Now, I am very blessed to be married in a family where we all love music. And we've got lots of musical instruments around the house. And we sing all the time. I've grown up around music. I went to school for music. So I'm generally always around good musicians. You know what I've learned about good musicians? Good musicians like good music. doesn't matter the style. You can take a, a salsa musician and as long as the music's good, they can hear it and go, and that's some good stuff. Worship should be the same way. As long as the heart of worship is good, we should not be distracted by the musical style. The problem is we're doing the same thing the Samaritans and the Jews did when we argue over style instead of substance, when we're too distracted by the instruments instead of the object. If Is Jesus worthy of worship all day, every day? Okay, in case you were missing it, the answer to that one was yes. Let's try that again. Is Jesus worthy of worship every day? Do you have access to a professional team of musicians every day? No. Does that make Jesus less worthy? No, it doesn't. It does sometimes make us less emotional. So now let's tackle the real animal in the room. There are many times, and I'm not going to, I'm going to keep my fingers back here. I'm not pointing at anybody in specific. But you got to ask yourself a question. How do you decide what is good worship? Is it by the way it makes you feel? Or by what you say to the King of Kings? You know? I've, I've worked in churches and I've attended churches where they decide what is good worship by how you feel on the way out of church. Well, if I am the determiner of what is good worship, I am also the object of that worship. Right? If he is the determiner of what is good worship, then my emotional response isn't there. I don't care if you came to church today and you don't feel good, and I don't care if you came to church and you do feel good. Why? Because Coach Bill don't care. <laughs> How, your emotional state when you walk into church does not change his worthiness at all. My emotional state, if I, I remember tons of times, my parents go back and watch these sermons, so Aunt Donna, I love you, but here's what happened. So when I was a teenager, when I was a teenager, you know, parents with teenagers, teenagers fight, right? Obviously, no one here. All of the teenagers in this room, you're perfect. I get it. But when I was a teenager, there'd be plenty of times that I was disobedient, that I was disrespectful, and my uncle owned a a Hunter Green Ford Explorer when I was a teenager. And we would be arguing and fighting like cats and dogs until the moment that the front tires of my uncle's Explorer touched the holy land that was the church parking lot. 
And as soon as the explorer pulled into the church parking lot, it was like the Shekinah holiness of God <laughs> fell in the truck and everybody was fine and we put on our church smiles and we walked into church and nobody knew that we were just screaming at each other 90 seconds beforehand. I'm sure I'm the only family that's ever experienced that, but let me just allow you to see into the lens of my life. It doesn't matter. And, and I mean this lovingly and I'm trying to say it gently. It doesn't matter how you feel about worship. He is worthy. That's the truth. The truth is Jesus is worthy whether you feel good or whether you feel bad. Whether you are in season or out of season. Whether it's your style or not your style. He is worthy. And 23 also gives you another very important truth. The Father is seeking those who will worship him correctly. God is not seeking those who will worship him the way you want. He is seeking those who will worship him the way he wants. 23 also gives us the how. 24, excuse me. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Now keep in mind, what was the Samaritan woman's original question? Worship there or over there? She was thinking about the physical aspect of worship. So Jesus corrects her by saying, you're totally off base. Worship has two aspects to it. The first, God is spirit. The entire gospel message, the entire gospel is about the newness of spiritual life. We're in John chapter 4. Think about John chapter 3 for a minute. John chapter 3, one of my favorite chapters in the entire book. A gentleman by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and tries to ask him, what's going on? We know you must be sent from God. Nobody can do the things you do. And Jesus lays on him the simple truth that you have to be born again. That flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. Now here in John chapter 4, Jesus uses the same term again, that we must worship God in spirit. Now this does not mean, as, as probably my Pentecostal and charismatic friends would say, that the only true worship can be done in the Holy Spirit. That's not what he said. He said must be done in the Spirit, meaning in the newness of spiritual life that comes through faith in Christ. And the truth of worship is that God and God alone is worthy of our worship and nothing else. So when you see the words spirit and in truth, understand the question that, that came before the answer. The question was over there or over there, the, the physical aspects of worship. And Jesus says, you're not getting it. This doesn't matter as much as this matters. The spiritual life within us is where worship begins. The truth of who Jesus is is where worship ends. And when you can connect those two dots, you have true worship. Worship comes from the spiritual life within you and it goes to the true object of worship, which is Christ the King. When you connect these two dots, you have true worship. Notice neither one of those dots have to deal with Samaria or Judea. Neither one of those dots have to deal with piano versus guitar. Neither one of those dots have to deal with musical style, lighting, sound, screen, skin color, racial ethnicity, nothing. Spiritual life to the spiritual king. That is what true worship is, and that is the kind of worship that God is seeking. But sadly, we get so distracted by the earthly aspects of worship. My wife showed me a post on Instagram last night, and I don't remember the exact wording, but it basically said the problem with worship is that it's become an industry instead of an activity. My wife and I, for years, have always believed that worship should be free, that teaching God's word should be free. You can't put a price on the gospel. You also can't put a price on how worthy he is, right? There's nothing on earth that could ever even get the, the, the edge of his worthiness. But because we've turned worship into an industry, we've also turned church on its head and styled most of what we do around the music that we sing. You know, the screens, the lights, you know, you have this, this church is this style and that church is that style. And, you know, we've 
made it about music, not about worship. Now, don't get me wrong. Music is a fantastic form of worship. But music's not the only form of worship. I can see in the scriptures, they worship God in prayer. They worship God in fasting. They worship God in reading his word. They worship God in community. Why? Spiritual life, spiritual king. If you connect these two dots in your life, you are giving the God the kind of worship that he has authorized and that he seeks. If you start with anything other than spiritual life or you aim at anything other than Jesus Christ, you are offering false worship. Now, I don't have the time to go into all the different examples. I did do a sermon series a few years ago called Worthless Worship. There are absolutely stories in the Bible where God rejects the worship of his people because they're giving it to him the wrong way. Um, Cain and Abel is one. Um, the uh, strange fire episode in the temple is another one. There are plenty of times that God says no. See, because you don't get to decide how to worship me. I tell you what is right and is not right because I'm the one that makes the rules. Then we get, uh, we get to verse 25. The woman now responds to Jesus' teaching and says, I know that the Messiah called Christ. Christ is just the Greek word for the Hebrew word Mishayach, meaning Messiah. So you see a little transliteration there. I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. What is verse 25? Verse 25 is the Samaritan woman putting her faith in the Messiah. What she didn't know is she was talking to him. The faith statement comes before the revelation that she's talking to the actual Messiah. But don't miss 25. She believed in the Messiah before Jesus revealed himself to her. I know, and what's buried into 25? When he comes, the Messiah, he will explain everything to us. If I could just simply reword what she said, I know when the Messiah comes, he'll teach us everything the right way. You see what's buried in that statement? Submission to the authority of what... For her, the coming Messiah. She was, just like the Old Testament, she was waiting for him to show up. Then, 26. I, the one speaking to you, am he. Jesus reveals himself to the heart of faith who was already seeking him to worship correctly. See, now some people will say that the, some people, some scholars would argue that the Samaritan woman's question about worship was all intentionally to move the focus off of her less than reputable character. That could be. But what I don't understand is, to me it doesn't matter what her motivation is, Jesus' teaching is still true. I don't care if the woman asked the question because she was trying to be distracting, or the woman asked the question because she truly had faith in Christ. Or maybe she had faith in Christ and still didn't like her skeletons laid bare. None of that, to me, changes the truth about what Jesus is saying. The only true worship that can be offered to God begins with the spiritual life within us and ends pointed at Christ and Christ alone. Nothing else matters. We've got to get in the mindset that our worship wars and our discussions about musical style and all these things, I, I mean, I can't even say they're secondary. Because they're, they're just nothing. If you can worship the Lord, and, and I find that this is definitely tough for musicians, so for the worship team especially. Doesn't it feel easier to worship when the music is good? And it feels tougher or more challenging to worship when, when the music is bad. For those of you who are tone deaf and you can't hear the difference, I am jealous. Just let me tell you that right now. I am super jealous. I've met people who just, they, and, and it's not an insult, they literally can't hear the difference in the pitch. That's okay. I can't play basketball. I'm not ashamed of that. It's just something I know I can't do. But you know what's really great? If you can't hear the difference, you're not distracted. For those of us who can hear the difference between in tune and out of tune, sometimes it's really hard. And I have to just keep recalling that, that Lord, you only said joyful noise, and God, that is noisy. But Lord, I just pray that you would, like, I literally have to grab a hold of myself and my overly judgmental musician self and be like, Lord, I'm, you know, and then I think about, have you ever heard a child sing a song? You know what I'm saying? Have you ever heard a child sing a song with all their might and all their gusto, but bro, it's out of tune? Does it matter? No. 
Because the one thing that that child does that the rest of us adults struggle to do is a child puts the heart out front. And they're not worried about the tune. And they're sometimes not worried about the style. And maybe they don't breathe correctly or they don't get the notes right. But you know what? None of that matters because it is so adorable. That's the image that I have to put in my mind when we worship. The other thing, if if you've ever noticed when we worship on Sunday morning, I have to close my eyes because I have to ignore the rest of you. It's very hard for me because I get easily distracted. Especially, especially since I'm back standing at the sound console, I get easily distracted because I can see all the backs of your heads. And I'm like, oh, I like that sweater Jen wore today. I wonder if that's warm. I wonder if, the, if it's too warm in here. Should I ask her if she's hot? I wonder if she's sweating. She sat down. I, <laughs> woo! My brain goes a million different places. <laughs> Ryan's laughing because he knows exactly how it feels, right? Once that rabbit takes off, you can't catch him again. You got to keep him holding back. How distracted do you get in worship? And I mean, I I use myself as a comical example, but we all struggle with being distracted. True worship, spiritual life within me, forward, given to Jesus Christ. Nothing else matters. It doesn't matter if the person next to you smells good or bad. It doesn't matter if the person next to you is singing or is texting. Why? Because that's their worship, not yours right? The cool thing about corporate worship is that we each bring ourselves. I cannot give God the spiritual life within Anthony. You know why? Because that's Anthony's to give to his Savior, not mine. All I can do is give what's in me. And when I give what's in me, and I'm next to Bob giving what's in Bob, and I'm next to Phil giving what's in Phil, and Lisa what's in Lisa, and Emily what's in Emily, that's what corporate worship looks like. If you come into corporate worship expecting to get something out of it, you're looking at it the wrong way. 